1715, Caroline of Ansbach, the wife of Prince George, heir to the throne of England, received a letter from a German philosopher who wished to impress upon her how the work of a prominent English scientist was incompatible with theology, particularly the idea of God's perfection. This drew the attention of the scientist's friend, who would write to the philosopher in response. This would finally give the philosopher a chance to almost directly challenge the scientist, who had already undermined his work and sabotaged his reputation. The German philosopher is Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. The English scientist is Sir Isaac Newton. His friend is Samuel Clarke. And this is one of philosophy's greatest stories. Born in 1646, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz was a German polymath who wrote on philosophy, theology, mathematics, logic and more besides. He is perhaps most famously known for his clash with Sir Isaac Newton over the invention of the mathematical concept of calculus. We shall not delve too deeply into this subject as we are more interested in their philosophical clash rather than their mathematical one, but make no mistake, like many of their early Enlightenment contemporaries, Descartes, Spinoza, Malebranche, Artaud, and so on, and as we discussed in episode 1, philosophy, science, and mathematics were intertwined disciplines at the time, and through the human endeavours of science, they were able to reveal truths about the nature of the world, and ultimately, God. Let us briefly recount the calculus controversy between Newton and Leibniz, before we begin our philosophical story. Newton and Leibniz had, independently between the years of 1670 and 1680, independently devised the mathematics of what would come to be known as calculus. Calculus is, essentially, a way to measure change. For example, to measure an object's acceleration or deceleration, we could plot its speed and distance travelled at regular intervals onto a graph, resulting in a line or a curve. Then, we can use calculus to determine the rate of change at any point on the object's path, or its reverse, calculate areas and volumes using such a point. Leibniz and Newton were not the first to discover and use elements of calculus, but they were the ones to present a unifying framework that allowed all of the different elements of calculus to fit together. When Newton and Leibniz published their work within the space of a few years of each other, a debate began to unfold in the scientific community as to which one of them had invented calculus first. To this end, the Royal Society of London launched an investigation to resolve the dispute, publishing the result in 1713. Their investigation concluded that Newton was the rightful inventor of calculus, and that Leibniz had probably seen some of Newton's earlier notes on the subject when he visited London in the mid-1670s. Evidence that Leibniz had purposely backdated some of his notes was also evidence against him. But one of his standard practices was, when he was ordering all of his papers, was to write the dates on them, sometimes years after the fact. Also, the pair had corresponded in letters around this same time, which probably spurred each of us to independently develop calculus, as each of their methods are very different, even if they serve the same purpose. On top of all this, it should be noted that the president of the Royal Society of London at the time of the investigation was Sir Isaac Newton, meaning that there is almost no way we can describe their judgement as impartial, and Newton was well known to be vindictive against anyone who challenged him. In fact, even after this decision was reached, Newton would continue to attack and rebuke Leibniz's work and character any time he was published or even mentioned. As such, the results of this investigation all but destroyed Leibniz's reputation in the scientific community. When his employer, George of Hanover, was asked to ascend to the English throne after the death of Queen Anne in 1714, Leibniz thought this would be a chance to rejoin the scientific community by moving to London with George as part of the new royal court. But George ordered Leibniz to stay in Hanover in Germany, probably because bringing Leibniz may have garnered negative public attention, as the calculus controversy was still very much in the public imagination at the time. As such, Leibniz was ordered to stay in Germany, the official reason being that he remained there until he could finish a family history of the House of Brunswick, which he was commissioned to do around 25 years earlier, but had only just finished the first volume. 
Leibniz was known to start a multitude of projects, but never finished them, only publishing one book, The Theodicy, during his lifetime. So, in 1715, we find Leibniz, now nearly 70 years old, ostracised by the scientific community, and surrounded by many unfinished works. He had retained a close friendship with a number of women of the royal court, including Caroline of Ansbach, who had become Queen Consort of England when her husband ascended to the throne as King George II in 1727. This is where we return to the beginning of our story. Leibniz wrote Caroline a letter outlining how Newton's science was incompatible with the greatness of God, which she showed to one Samuel Clarke, a friend of Sir Isaac Newton and a philosopher and cleric himself. He wrote to Caroline in defence of Newton's ideas, and probably had a helping hand by Newton himself in writing them, a belief that Caroline and Leibniz also shared. What followed was a correspondence that serves as a broad and rather concise outline of their different philosophical positions on God, time, space, free will, matter, and much more besides. Let us delve into these letters to see what we can learn. Leibniz's first letter is a straightforward establishing of his position that natural religion is in decay in England. Materialism is rampant, and it doesn't stop at understanding matter, but tries to provide a material explanation of the soul, and the immaterial too, something that Leibniz believes undermines the work of God. Specifically, that souls move and act without thought or reason essentially diminishes God's relevance if the soul does not need to appeal to God for understanding or that the soul's actions are not guided by God's grace. He partially praises John Locke, who we discussed in the previous episode, as being uncertain at least about this leaning towards materialism in his essay concerning human understanding, which Leibniz examined further in his unpublished New Essays Concerning Human Understanding. Leibniz offers no such leniency on Newton, accusing him of undermining God's perfection. Sir Isaac Newton says that space is an organ, which God makes use of to perceive things by. But if God stands in need of any organ to perceive things by, it will follow that they do not depend altogether on him, nor were produced by him. If God is perfect, why would he need an organ, or machine, as space is here described, to help him perceive the universe? It also suggests that this organ is outside of God, which would also mean he is not the creator of everything. Leibniz next targets Newton's position on the conservation of energy. When objects in the universe collide, they transfer energy from one body to another in the form of momentum. However, during momentum, some of that energy is lost before they can collide, which critics of Newton's laws would point out would eventually lead to a universe devoid of all energy. Newton's answer to this is that God must intervene from time to time to replenish that energy and essentially, this is God's role in the universe. Leibniz, unsurprisingly, disagrees on this role of God. According to their doctrine, God Almighty needs to wind up his watch from time to time, otherwise it would cease to move. He did not, it seems, have sufficient foresight to make it a perpetual motion. Leibniz's position is that God, in his infinite power, would not have created such a poorly designed mechanism that leaks force and needs a bit of maintenance from time to time. God does not need to intervene in the mechanics of the universe, so when he does intervene, it is due to his grace and wisdom. This is how we know God is good. He chooses to intervene not out of necessity, but to bestow miracles and grace out of pure goodness and not for personal gain. The God of Newton has to intervene to balance the laws of nature, as it is essentially his job to perform maintenance on the works he has created, and as such, God's actions cannot be good if they are simply done out of necessity, like a watchmaker fixing his watch. Samuel Clarke's first reply to Leibniz, written in November 1715, the same as Leibniz's first letter, addresses each of Leibniz's points in turn. It starts fairly cordially, with Clark agreeing with Leibniz on the work of materialists and their attempts to apply materialist principles to the soul. What he calls the mathematical principles of philosophy prove that matter is the most inconsiderable part of the universe, and these principles are not to be derived from matter, but knowledge imparted to us by God to understand all that is around us. The main point of this letter, though, is where Clark starts to defend Newton. 
He corrects Leibniz in saying that Newton did not say that space is an organ by which God perceives things, but rather that God, being present at all points in space, can perceive everything at once, without the need of an organ to sense them. Newton's position, he continues, is that humans construct the images of things they perceive through their bodies, and the mind can see these images because the mind and body are in close proximity to each other. Likewise, God, by being everywhere at once, is in close proximity to everything in space. This, Clark claims, is what Newton meant by space being a sensorium or organ through which God perceives things. It should perhaps be apparent that Clark has only corrected Leibniz on his incorrect interpretation of a metaphor and not address the issue of depleting forces in the universe and God's role in having to fix it. Leibniz's second letter, wrote at the end of December 1715, opens up with a slight correction on Clark that the materialists oppose the mathematical principles of philosophy is not true, but rather, Leibniz claims that they only admit bodies and material substances, and not immaterial substances, such as the soul and the mind. He name drops Thomas Hobbes, who in our last episode, we showed how in his 1651 book Leviathan, he attempted to apply Galileo's theory of motion and bodies to how the mind operates. Leibniz's theories around immateriality are built upon the ideas of the soul outlined by the ancient Greek philosophers Pythagoras, Aristotle and Plato. And while most philosophers and scientists were moving away from these traditional works, Leibniz sought to retain their logic of immaterial substances, which created a perception of him being quite old-fashioned and out of touch, further cemented by his out-of-date fashion, such as being known to wear the oversized wigs that had long since gone out of style. But make no mistake, Leibniz fully embraced the new sciences. He just also thought there was room for the logic of immaterial substances too, and that the mathematical principles of materialism and the metaphysical principles of immaterialism were arranged in what he called a pre-established harmony by God. So any questions regarding the separation of mind and body, the prevailing conclusion of Descartes' philosophy, were rendered pointless, as Leibniz believed that God had made mind and body work together at the same time, so it was pointless to question the nature of their interaction, where there was no problem, as we see in our daily lives that the two seem to interact and respond to one another just fine. Leibniz refers here to his book Theodicy, which Caroline of Ansbach wanted Samuel Clarke to translate into English, but she believed him to be too close to Isaac Newton. In this book, Leibniz outlines two principles that, developed from the theories of the ancient Greek philosophers, demonstrates a rigorous definition of the principles which he believes provide the foundation for both material and immaterial substances. These also provide the foundation for Leibniz's entire philosophy, so are worth going over here. First, for matter and the principles of mathematics, Leibniz has developed the principle of contradiction, or identity. This is most simply expressed in the statement A equals A and cannot be not A. For example, 2 equals 2 and cannot equal something other than 2. That this provides the foundation for all mathematics and geometry should be easily derived. If something equals something other than itself, then none of mathematics can ever make sense. None of the formulas and mathematical operations would be of any value if the number 2 could also equal the number 3, for example. The second principle, which allows us to move from mathematics to philosophy and to the study of immaterial substances, is the principle of sufficient reason. This simply states that everything happens for a reason, and there must always be a reason why things are the way they are and not otherwise. For example, we can simply accept as fact that A equals A, and that certain laws of physics work to describe the motion of matter in the universe. If we want to know why those laws of physics apply to our universe rather than any other law, then we are asking a philosophical question, and we defer to our principle of sufficient reason, that there must be a reason why the laws of physics are this way rather than another. It may be, as in most cases concerning the nature of the universe, 
that the reason is something that only God can comprehend. But there is a reason, according to Leibniz, and if only God can comprehend it, then it just supports Leibniz's position from the previous letter that we should respect God's grace and wisdom in choosing the best physics and principles for our universe. The two principles, the principles of identity and the principles of sufficient reason, form the basis of Leibniz's entire philosophy, and these will also form the basis of his position in the debate with Clark, so they will be important to bear in mind going forward. Leibniz continues with his attack on Newton's philosophy, such as Newton's position that space is mostly empty, and matter is the most inconsiderable part of the universe. Leibniz's objection to this is simply that, based on the principle of sufficient reason, God would have no need to create empty space with no matter. The more matter in the universe, the more there is for God to act upon with his grace and wisdom. As such, Leibniz denies the possibility of there being a vacuum in space. Leibniz also takes aim again at the use of the term sensorium being used to describe space as an organ, this time directly quoting optics, one of Newton's most famous published works. With regard to Clark's answer that the soul perceives what is happening in the brain because they are next to each other, Leibniz is not at all convinced. He says that simply being near to something is not enough to perceive it. To be present is not enough to perceive, he essentially says. Some form of communication is required between these substances. The difference between Clark and Leibniz here seems to be a differing view of perception. Clark's perception is more passive, in that simply being in close proximity is enough to perceive objects. Leibniz's perception is much more active, in that proximity is not enough for objects to interact, so there must be some form of communication between them, which happens metaphysically or by immaterial means. This is based in part on Aristotle's concept of entelechy, which is a kind of mental communication between entities that allows them to recognise one another. Perception for Leibniz is a technical term he uses to describe the encountering of other entities and actively, consciously grasping their presence. This also separates Leibniz from Descartes, who believed that only humans had the capacity to perform this active perception. Leibniz notes that Cartesians fail to account for non-conscious perceptions, such as the interaction between a human and a stone. Both perceive the other to a degree. The stone does not consciously perceive the human because it is not conscious. But still, it responds if the human kicks it across the ground. This is not a mindless, indifferent transfer of force for Leibniz. The stone knows how to act when kicked in its own extremely limited capacity. Every entity in the universe, not just people, have these perceptions that allow them to respond and understand, to varying degrees, what is happening to them. He calls the immaterial substances monads, described more fully in his 1714 paper, The Monadology, and each entity we perceive is actually a monad, from the smallest stone to every individual human, the only difference between monads being the clarity of their perception, from the weak, blurred perceptions of the stone's monad, to the more clear perceptions of the human's monad, which we would typically call the soul. God himself, the only monad with perfect clarity, perceives everything in the universe with absolute clarity. This also ties into God's role in the universe. He is not merely present, but active. He is actively producing goodness and wisdom in all of its inhabitants, granting them clarity and constantly tweaking the universe so that things happen for the good of all. Again, this follows the principle of sufficient reason, that every action must have a reason to happen. It is for this reason that we praise God in making the best decisions, and not for Clark and Newton's reason, that God is praised for his workmanship in creating the universe as an entity, like the way we praise a watchmaker for making a watch. The watch, when it is complete, has no interaction with the watchmaker and runs on its own unless it breaks. And according to Leibniz in his first letter, the watch that is the universe will eventually break due to the diminishing amount of forces in the universe, according to 
Newton's laws. God, for Leibniz, must be constantly at work in the universe, constantly altering and adjusting. This we should not see as him correcting faults, but following and executing a divine plan for which we should give praise for his work. Leibniz's God is a busy God indeed, continually using his wisdom to make things better, and for this we should praise him. Clark seems to agree with Leibniz on his principle of sufficient reason, to a degree. He adds that many of the reasons why things are the way they are, and not otherwise, can only be God's will, that he simply chose things to be one way rather than another. If anything did not have a reason for being one way rather than another, we would lose free will and the ability to choose. On the subject of vacuums and empty space, Clark disagrees with Leibniz by saying the existence of a vacuum and the existence of empty space does not diminish the role of God or his greatness. On the subject of vacuums and empty space, Clark disagrees with Leibniz by saying the existence of a vacuum and the existence of empty space does not diminish the role of God or his greatness. Everything is still equally a subject for God to work his greatness upon. It is like saying that there must be an infinite number of everything in the universe. Clark also does not either understand or share Leibniz's definition of perception still claiming that inanimate objects cannot perceive. This disagreement is perhaps to Clark misunderstanding Leibniz's specific term he uses to define perception, which Clark mistranslated in his original translations to be a more common form of passive perception. On the subject of the soul being indivisible, Clark fails to see how it relates to space being divisible. Leibniz does not believe that the soul can exist at a point in space, and neither does Clark. But Clark's reasoning is that space is indivisible, but also not composed of points. God's perception of things is not a mere presence, claims Clark, but him being a living and intelligent being that perceives things. Again, Clark and Leibniz are almost in agreement, but this disparity between what they mean by perception seems to be keeping them apart. We should praise God, Clark writes, for coming up with the idea of the universe, and also for its continued operation as a perfect work. But that still seems to not answer Leibniz's issue in his first letter, that the amount of force in the universe eventually diminishes, so God must intervene to fix it. Clark answers this by saying that the intervention is not for God's purpose, but for our sakes, and his intervention is all a part of his plan to make a universe that lasts as long as he sees fit, in the eyes of God, there can be no error. What we perceive as error is just a part of God's perfect design, and we cannot grasp his wisdom in this respect. The division between natural and supernatural is but a division based on our own understandings as finite beings, similar to the division we see between the compound body and soul. God does not follow this rule, Clark states, and he is present but independent of the world as a governor, who is not subject to the same laws of cause and effect as everyone else. God cannot be acted on by a cause, as he is the perfect, supreme being. Leibniz returns Clark's second letter, again using the principle of sufficient reason to ground his argument, which he claims voids Clark's and Newton's conception of space, if space is an absolute thing, as they suggest, it must be eternal and infinite. This may lead to the conclusion that space may belong to God as a part, who is also eternal and infinite. Leibniz is here probably making reference to Spinoza, a Dutch philosopher who shared some of Leibniz's earlier ideas. If space is made of parts, as Clark suggests, then it cannot be a part of God, because God is not made up of parts, he is indivisible and immaterial, again rejecting the materialism of the soul that Leibniz dismissed in his first letter. Leibniz here makes his own position clear. As for my own opinion, I have said more than once that I hold space to be something purely relative, as time is, that I hold it to be an order of coexistences, as time is an order of successions. When thinking about time and space, 
the term relative invokes a certain way of thinking, namely Einstein's theory of relativity, which overturned Newton's conception of space and time at the beginning of the 20th century. Did Leibniz predict relativity nearly 200 years before Einstein? To say that space and time are relative is to say that they are relational. It only exists as the relation between bodies. If there are no bodies, there would be no space, which is different than Newton's space as an entity that exists independent of any bodies that occupy it. Space is, for Leibniz, an order of bodies, and time is an order of successions, which would line up with Einstein's conception of time and space. Leibniz does not produce any mathematical principles for his proof of relativity, which he believes to be an issue of metaphysical reasoning, relying on his principle of sufficient reason rather than mathematical formulae. He does this like so. If space is uniform, in that it is the same at any point, then there would be no reason for it to be made the way it was, violating the principle of sufficient reason. For example, if space was created but with east changed to west, then it would make no difference to anything in the universe. There would be no reason why space was created with east or west being the way they are, thus violating the idea that everything has a reason for being the way it is. The same also holds true for time. If time is an independent thing, there would be no reason for the universe to begin at a particular time, or half an hour earlier, for example. Leibniz again claims that Clark's interpretation of the principle of sufficient reason is wrong because he likens it to God's will being the reason why things are the way they are. God has no reason other than his will to do things in a certain way. This leads to the dangerous idea that God is indifferent to the universe and his decisions are not wise or good. God, Leibniz says, always acts in the best interests of the universe and its inhabitants. If he just does things according to his will, rather than what he knows in his infinite wisdom to be right and good, then it must be concluded that he doesn't care about what happens to those subjects to his will, which Leibniz logically cannot reconcile. The rest of the letter is Leibniz's reiteration of his previous points, that God would have no reason to create empty space with nothing in it, that he could not act upon. God does not just exist in the world, he acts upon it. And there is nothing he is indifferent to. Everything can be explained in terms of the bodies in the universe, but we must turn to the metaphysical principles that Leibniz builds his reasoning upon to understand why things are the way they are. He ends by readdressing the notion of miracles and what counts as one, namely the attraction of bodies such as the earth orbiting the sun. Leibniz would deem that a miracle because it cannot be explained, not without the concept of gravity anyway, which Leibniz doesn't believe in, as it would be an indifferent force that would replace the intervention of God. In his fourth letter, dated May 1716, Clark again disputes Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason saying that God's will is a sufficient reason where there is no object to influence, and, because space is uniform, it does not matter where objects are placed in it. He also says that if the Earth and the Sun were placed in a different part of the universe, then because the universe is the same all over, they would be in the same place now, which is a contradiction. That God always acts in the best, wisest manner seems to Clark to rob God of any free will to act, making him a mechanical slave to the universe that he is operating on. Clark sees it as an imperfection that God cannot simply do whatever he wants at any time. That the universe has diminishing forces to be replenished, Clark reiterates, is not a flaw in the universe, but part of God's design, and that we only see it as a flaw because we cannot comprehend God's work. That a work is directly affected by God does not make it a miracle. If everything that cannot be explained by mathematical principles or bodies is a miracle, then the motion of animals would be a miracle, which Clark sees as absurd. He does, however, fail to explain what he believes an actual miracle is. Leibniz's letters start to get much more extensive with his fourth, 
dated June 1716, but mostly retread the points already expressed. That Clark is unwilling to yield on Leibniz's key points regarding the principles of sufficient reason and identity, and so we shall just focus on the key points here. On the subject of God creating things by will alone, Leibniz says that will always has a motive, otherwise it simply ceases to be will. With regards to space being in order of things, he says that placing objects indifferently in an order is not an order at all. If you do not care what order things are in, it is not really an order. Regardless, God would not create identical particles anyway, according to Leibniz. If the only difference between objects is their position in space and or time, then they are the same object because space is independent from these bodies. This violates the first of Leibniz's laws, the principle of identity, because two bodies cannot both be the same thing if they are different. For this reason, Leibniz also dismisses the idea of atoms, a universal standard building block from which everything is built. The machines that humans build fail because they are separated from the maker when they are finished. Because God never separates himself from the universe, as both Leibniz and Clark agree, then the universe should never fall into error, such as the diminishing forces that Newton's theory describes. But at this point, it is probably predictable to say that Clark will respond to that, that it is not an imperfection of God's nature that he needs to intervene, but because he has designed it in this way, and it is only imperfect in our eyes as finite beings who cannot understand God's reason. Leibniz further clarifies his definition of miracle by saying that not everything unusual can be a miracle. That would make monsters miracles, for example. Angels can create minor miracles, such as making a man walk on water, but only God can create absolute miracles, such as creating or annihilating substance. God, for Leibniz, would have created the maximum amount of substance at the start of the universe, because there would be no reason to create things later on, and would also have no need to create empty space to place new things that he creates. Just as God is the only one that can create substance, then he should also be the only one who can destroy them. When Clark supposes that the motion of animals is a miracle, according to Leibniz, he does so on the supposition that anything we cannot understand is a miracle, which is, for Leibniz, absurd. Since there are many things we do not understand that we would never describe as miracles. A miracle is something only God, or angels to a lesser degree, could do, such as the creation and annihilation of substance or matter. In a lengthy postscript, Leibniz attacks the notion of space being a vacuum, again for the reasons discussed. Clark's fourth reply, also dated June 1716, starts with a refute of Leibniz's first principle, by saying that identical bodies can exist, but differentiate themselves by being active substances that can move themselves. Again, it seems we are going to get no further on this point, as long as Clark refutes this first principle of Leibniz's. Clark also supports this position by saying that two objects can be alike, such as two drops of water, but that this does not follow Leibniz's reasoning, as he sees it, that the two objects are in the same place, because space, as a separate entity, differentiates them. Void space, as he terms the vacuum of empty space, is not empty per se, but merely empty of matter. God may reside there, alongside other substances which are not matter. Space relies on God for its existence, and without it, he cannot be everywhere at once, and his omnipresence would be removed. Clark also sees the inability for God to make less matter in the world as a limit on God's power. Clark's position that time and space are quantities rather than orders is another sticking point that he claims to have proved, like Leibniz has proved time and space are orders, not quantities. And so the two seem to be at an intellectual deadlock at this point, provoking each other to answer the other's proofs. Clark addresses Leibniz's postscript by simply stating that all of his concerns have already been answered, 
and that matter is infinitely divisible is an absurdity. Because if matter were to be cut infinitely, you would find more empty space than matter, and that would mean that matter is mostly empty space. A position quite absurd to him, but something we now know, according to the standard atomic model, to be true, that an atom is mostly empty space, although Leibniz or Clark could not have been aware of this. Leibniz's fifth reply in August 1716 continues in the manner in which the other letters have, and again, an intellectual deadlock seems to have been reached, with neither willing to concede on key principles. Leibniz begins to speculate whether Clark truly does not understand his principles, or just wants to pick holes in his thought, suggesting that the discussion at this point is more personal than intellectual. Accusing Leibniz of necessity and fatalism, that God must act in certain ways, is untrue, because Leibniz says God has created a world in which people can act freely, and his actions have been out of necessity to that. The fact that Clark believes the will can act without a reason is something Leibniz cannot accept. Clark seems to conflate what God won't do with what he can't do. God could certainly make a bad decision, but he won't because he only does what is best. Any act or imposition upon empty space for Leibniz is a pointless abstraction and reflects nothing about the real world, so Clark's arguments about vacuums are, for him, just imaginary problems that reflect nothing about the real world. On the question of why was the world not created sooner than it was, for Leibniz it is again a pointless question, as time and space are only orders and they could not have existed without things having been created. The principle of identity is again brought up saying that God would not just create things and decide where to put them, as Clark seems to suggest. Everything has a reason to be created. Essentially, since Clark fails to follow the principle of sufficient reason, everything else he says is absurd, and it is pointless to entertain him on those points. The fifth letter by Clark, dated October 29th, 1716, continues to attack Leibniz on the principle of sufficient reason, essentially saying that Leibniz cannot know what is wise for God to do, and what is not, so his constant reliance on that for his arguments are invalid. Clark attempts to clarify that space and time are necessary consequences of God's existence, rather than that they rely on him. But the fact that Clark is still treating them as real things is not likely to persuade Leibniz to adjust his position. He also objects to attraction, or gravity, being termed a miracle, as Newton's theory of gravity had been well defined by that point. Leibniz believes the interaction between bodies is not done via physical forces, but via immaterial substances that have a representation of everything going on outside of themselves within them. A body does not see outside of itself. Instead, it responds to the reflections of outside substances within itself. It is God who, through the principle of pre-established harmony, created the universe so that bodies and souls work in conjunction with one another, and that those reflections are accurate. That Leibniz uses this unverifiable principle, instead of a provable theory of gravity, Clark simply cannot entertain. Leibniz's response to this letter, unfortunately, never came. He died on November 14th, 1716, some two weeks after Clark's letter was dated. It is difficult to see what more Leibniz's response could have contributed though, as the two had seemingly reached an intellectual stalemate, with neither conceding anything on the other's positions. As such, we can see this correspondence as fairly exhaustive of the subjects they discuss. The Clark-Leibniz correspondence, as we have seen, discusses a vast range of philosophical concepts and draws a clear dividing line between the science and philosophy of Newton and Leibniz. Let us attempt to briefly summarise these two positions. First, on space and time. Newton's space is an eternal, infinite and empty plane that exists independent of bodies. Any body that exists must have a position in space and a position in time, and it is only the bodies that move through them, 
Space and time cannot be stretched, shrunk or altered in any way. Leibniz says that time and space are instead relative and only exist as an order between bodies. He says that space cannot be empty as God would have no reason to create space with nothing in it to use his wisdom upon. This is also why God could not have created the universe sooner than he did or swapped east and west for example. They did not exist before the universe and its matter was created. On atoms, Newton's science requires matter to be composed of single particles of matter that, following his conception of space, are situated at a single indivisible position in space and time. And since all atoms are the same, they all follow the same laws in a uniform space. Atoms themselves are indivisible and alike, forming the foundational building blocks of all matter. Leibniz does not believe in atoms, instead believing matter to be infinitely divisible, that any bit of matter could be infinitely cut a number of times. Remember that Clark dismissed this because it would mean that atoms would be necessarily empty space. One of Leibniz's metaphysical principles, the principle of contradiction or identity, proves for Leibniz that two identical bodies can't exist at different points in the universe, because they would be different, but similar at the same time, being the same atoms at different points in space. Leibniz also says this would violate his principle of sufficient reason, saying that God would have no reason to make two things the same. He would want the maximum amount of variety in the universe, so there were more things for him to act upon. For Newton, the force that governs how two bodies interact is gravity, which can be explained using mathematical principles. Leibniz does not believe gravity is a credible force in the universe. He believed that the interaction of bodies was a metaphysical principle instead of a mathematical one, and thus is managed by God directly for the interest of both bodies. That an indifferent force such as gravity would move things around without any wisdom or care for the bodies involved does not fit Leibniz's idea of a well-managed universe. The constitution of Newton's universe is that there is a diminishing amount of force in the universe, that forces gradually leak out of the universe with every interaction. To counter this, God must intervene from time to time to add in new force. Clark says this is not a problem at all, and not the sign of God building a flawed universe, because God designed it to have this need to be maintained from time to time, and it is only our limited understanding as finite, earthly beings that make us perceive it as a flaw. Leibniz did not believe that forces would simply vanish, or that God would design such a flawed universe. He elsewhere outlined a different mathematical equation for how force related to mass that didn't result in that loss. The universe that God has created does not need new things added to it. Everything that needs to be created would have been done so at the beginning of the universe, so that God's role is to manage those beings he created, for the benefit of all. With regards to the principle of sufficient reason, that everything that happens in the universe must happen for a reason, Clark indicates that God's will is enough of a sufficient reason for things to happen in the universe, but Leibniz disagrees. God will always choose the best course of action, not simply because he wills something. If God acted on will alone, that would make him indifferent to the things he acts upon, whereas God should, according to Leibniz, act in his subject's best interest. All in all, the gap that separates Newton and Leibniz is fairly substantial. They both embrace the new sciences, as shown in their development of calculus, but their philosophical differences are great, as shown in their back and forth with the exchange of letters. The origin of forces, the role of God, and the existence of space are the main sticking points that, even through the entire correspondence, neither Clark nor Leibniz conceded an inch on their respective positions. So, who came out on top in this philosophical clash between Newton and Leibniz? As we've already mentioned, Newton was declared, by himself mostly, to have been the inventor of calculus, which led to Leibniz's reputation being tarnished and him disappearing into obscurity. Newton's work became one of the cornerstones of the Enlightenment, providing the foundation for both science and philosophy 
throughout this historical period. The French writer Voltaire would praise Newton as someone who would enlighten people with his wisdom, while mocking Leibniz's proposition that this is the best of all possible worlds, because God would not make any other, despite the horror of war and natural disasters we actually see in the world. However, Leibniz managed one victory in this case. His notation for calculus, such as the symbols he used for differentiation and integration, are the ones we use in calculus today and are much more efficient and elegant than Newton's method of manipulating what he called fluxions. But again, we shall not go into the mathematics here. Nearly 200 years after his death, Leibniz's work gained renewed interest at the beginning of the 20th century. New translations of his work, discussed by Bertrand Russell in English and Louis Couturat in French, introduced Leibniz's work to a new generation. At around this time, Newton's science was also facing a challenge by the work of one Albert Einstein and his theories of relativity. As we have already discussed, Leibniz's belief that space and time were relative rather than absolute means that his philosophy was much more in line with Einstein than Newton's. Leibniz's philosophy also resonated with the mathematics of fractals, in that he conceived of matter that could be subdivided infinitely, revealing more of that same matter at a smaller scale, which is precisely what fractals entail when you zoom in on them, that the same shapes repeat infinitely. If you were bold, you may say that Leibniz's theory of communication between immaterial substances of souls may resemble the quantum physics concept of entanglement, but obviously we should be clear that Leibniz would have had no knowledge of Einstein's relativity or quantum physics as a whole. Newton's physics is still useful today to explain the motion and interaction of certain bodies, but when we get into quantum physics, we find a need to look beyond what he accomplished. With regards to the philosophy of space-time, Leibniz certainly resonates more with what we know with the turn to quantum physics, and his discovery of binary language for expressing mathematical operations can arguably make him one of the first philosophers of modern computation. While Newton and Leibniz shared the pursuit of science and mathematics, their philosophy was certainly at odds with one another. While Leibniz's thought provided a solid foundation for other Enlightenment thinkers, Leibniz has resonated profoundly with philosophers and mathematics in the 20th century and beyond, meaning that both of their contributions have been recognised as philosophically significant, worthwhile, and have their own chapter in the history of philosophy, both in what they share and what makes them unique.